Welcome to the Speakeasy Sports Show. Time to pull up a seat, pour a glass, and talk some ball. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Speakeasy Sports Show, college sports and high spirits. And uh, you know John, I am Daniel, nobody wants to hear from John, I have the pleasure of introducing, making her Speakeasy Sports debut tonight, LSU fan, don't hold that against her, Um, and noted knower of ball, Daily Joy is here. Joy, how are you feeling tonight? Welcome to the Speakeasy Sports Show. I'm feeling great. I'm happy to be here. I feel a little bit better now that LSU beat Nichols. It was a little tough to go there for the first half. Um, but, you know, I'm making it. I'll probably feel less good next week after college game day heads to my game. But we'll we'll see about that. But, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Playing the juggernaut South Carolina next week. So, mm. I mean, like, who could who could get in the way of that Beamer train, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Know. Yeah, our, our defense definitely won't. That's for sure. Um, John, John, how we doing this evening? Ready to talk? To I'm you doing good. I'm doing good. Listen, we, we put out our top 25, um, yeah. on Twitter and Instagram and joy actually ranked South Carolina. And I was like, South Carolina. And then it's now it all makes sense. Yeah. LSU yeah. is about to get a ranked win. It's all coming per together. The daily yeah. joy top 25. I was trying to figure out South That's Carolina right. and now it makes sense. So, um, it's yeah, chestnut checkers. Yeah. <laughs> Got to respect the opponent. It's uh, no. it's just not checkers around here. So uh, yeah, good, not good Joy's first rodeo. We are um, excited to have her on the show. <laughs> um, she'll be a face you'll be seeing a lot uh, around Speakeasy Sports, which we're excited about. Um, but man, guys, what a weekend we had mm. in college football. We're going to jump right into it. Excited to have you along. If you're new, um, if you're only here because Joy posted about it and you like you made your way here, uh, subscribe to the show. Um, uh, we would love to have you. We talk college ball uh, year round, college sports and high spirits, um, everything that goes along with that. So um, uh, let's jump into this Saturday, though. John, I'm going to start with you. Your biggest takeaway from Saturday. Uh, where do you want to take us? Because, man, it was a it was a wild day of football. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we might as well go right to the Mecca. We might as well go right to the big house, right to Texas and Michigan. Um, we'll start there. Uh, Texas really might be back, Daniel. Texas might After be back. all these years. <laughs> After all these years. Okay. So listen, now we've heard this before, right? We've heard this before, but I want to give you just a little bit of reasoning why Texas really might be back from 2010 to 2020. Texas lost five games or more in eight out of 11 seasons after, you know, that was Mac Brown's debacle, all those things. So yeah. they hired Steve Sarkeesian. He came in, went five and seven his first year. There's this whole like, okay, here we go again, Texas. Here we go. Next year went eight and five. And remember in 2022 when um, they played that Alabama team with Bryce Young and it was a 20 to 19 game and everybody was like, oh, it's a, you know, well, that was just a fluke and whatever. That that should have been the moment that we knew. Yeah, Quinn Ewers Sarkeesian... goes down in that game. If Quinn yeah, Ewers doesn't goes go down, down, Texas wins that game. Texas yeah. wins the game. But watching, that's when we should have known. And what the difference that Sarkeesian has brought to this Texas team is uh, up front in the trenches, it is absolute maulers. I mean, physicality. Yeah. Um, they're starting 2024 looking like the best team in the country after making the college football playoff last year. And – it's all up front. And when I watch them play Michigan, you all know, like Michigan, listen, Michigan lost a lot of players. Michigan lost their coach. Michigan lost Connor Stallions. Michigan yeah. lost like oh, wow. all of their, all of the, all of the keys to their success mm-hmm. no longer are in the building. Boy, especially the Michigan Connor fans Stallions. in the comments right now, John, are just <laughs> lighting you up. Well, it's, a, well, I mentioned Connor Stallions because that was the drinking game. So I just wanted to yeah, yeah, yeah. be able to take a yeah. drink. Um, but uh, no, no, but but you know, Michigan, like this is a team that Jim Harbaugh, these guys are still there. I mean, Jim Harbaugh built built this team on the trenches, built this team on a defensive line. And when that game was seven to three, and Texas took the ball and went 12 plays, 76 yards, and Jarrett Gibson just ran it down the throat of Michigan, that was when I was like, oh, damn, like Texas really might be, they really might be back. And um, 
And I think, you know, for me, it starts it starts on the offensive line, but also on the defensive line. That's this true freshman, Colin Simmons. If you guys haven't watched him, that guy is unreal. He uh, leads all, all SEC true freshmen in quarterback pressure. So, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Here's, here's where I want to end, though, with Texas being back, is that no one got up on a podium and said, we're back. You know, like, no one did that. But there was a little bit of that in the postgame. Um, the linebacker Baron Sorrell, after the Michigan game, Michigan game, he said, we're a dominant team and we're here to stay. This is what we do now. So that might have been we're back without the we're back. Um, but shout out to Texas, man, and shout out to Steve Sarkeesian because this is a guy who he beat Nick Saban last year in Nick Saban's own house. I mean, um, and he has built it on on culture and um, physicality and just guys that – just believe they they are better than you, and they're going to come out and just impose their will. And you just haven't seen that from Texas in a while. Um, and then the other one, uh, maybe lesser. So I will I will give you my own little bit of bias with Tennessee. Tennessee, this Nico kid really might be him. Like Nico, t- the Tennessee offense under Josh Heupel just looks fundamentally different. Even then when Hendon Hooker in 2022, when Jalen Hyatt and all those guys were doing all these things, Nico, his, the, the, the kid just has the intuition to make reads, to get rid of the ball. Tennessee has a running game. And then the thing that Tennessee has to add, which is, I was just talking about Texas and why I grouped these two together, is that physicality on the defense side of the ball. So Tennessee is actually playing defense up front, physical defense. Now with Tennessee, I'll soften it just a little bit. I think Tennessee is legit. I think Tennessee is legit this year. Uh, my thing is I am going to need to see Tennessee score tw- more than 20 points on Kirby Smart um, if I'm going to believe that they're actually back um, because Kirby Smart seems to be the kryptonite. It's like every, every time Tennessee is like bombing away, 52 on Alabama, uh, they roll in and play Kirby Smart in Georgia and they can't score more than 20. So, um, But that being said, Texas and Tennessee, man, they look legit. They looked the apart, uh, especially Texas. And um, I'm, I'm excited. It's you know that there's this old saying that I hate personally. That's like college football is better when this team is good and blah blah blah. College football is better when Texas and Tennessee are good. It just is. Like it just it's just better. Um, I don't know if that's true, better. but college football Twitter is better when te- <laughs> when Texas and Tennessee are good. That's that where is I was going. That's where I was going. It's, it's, like, for yeah. me, for me, it's nothing about the team. It is when when Texas and Tennessee fans are bowing their chests. Yeah. I mean, when they are when they when the memes are flo- are flowing, um, mm-hmm. and they're not hiding in their holes, and you know Tennessee fans drinking moonshine somewhere by themselves. It is a fantastic sport. Um, I mean, it's a better sport. It's already the greatest sport in the world, but it's even better yeah. when Tennessee fans and Texas fans are bowing their chests out there. Joy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Both Texas and Tennessee make the playoff this year. True or false? Ooh. I honestly might say true at that one. Um, Tennessee doesn't have that hard of an SEC schedule. Um, and I, I mean, Texas definitely got the easier route versus Oklahoma coming in. I mean, Oklahoma has to run a run through the gauntlet. Um, I think the only team that has it worse than them at this point is Florida. Um, so I think Texas could make a legitimate run. Um, Tennessee, I think there's probably a couple more question marks. However, Nico yesterday, I don't even think played his best game. Like, I don't think Nico was even at the top of his game. And if he was, I don't even want to know what that final score would have been for NC State. But that, if N- Nico at his top at that level could score more than twenty on Georgia, and that is yeah. that saying something. So I, I, I'm at this moment in time, I think I'm I'm inclined to say true. Yeah, I did mean, you guys see? Crazy. Oh, I'm sorry. Just real quick, no, did you ahead. guys see after the after Tennessee uh, obliterated poor? UTC um, for Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. Did you guys see the coach that <laughs> they asked him? They said, "Do you think you'll you'll play uh, a player with the caliber of Nico uh, <laughs> the rest of the season?" And he literally, this guy looked in the camera and he goes, "Hell, I hope not." <laughs> Just shook his head. The sport coach, he was he just had his hands on his knees. He was like, "Man, so yeah. that's what that's what Nico's out there doing to people right now." There's a lot of fan bases that are going to be feeling that way after they play Tennessee this year. I have a feeling. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, 
I, everybody's on the Nico train, and listen, I get it. Like, he's very good. He's better than Hendon Hooker, to your point from earlier, John. He's mm-hmm. better than Hendon Hooker. But let's give some credit where credit's due because so far, as a head coach, every time Josh Heifel doesn't have Joe Milton as a starting quarterback, that offense is really freaking good. So um, I think – you said Kirby Smart might be Josh Heifel's kryptonite. I think Joe Milton might be Josh Heifel's kryptonite. And so – like, <laughs> as long as no more Joe Milton's start walking through that door in Knoxville, God. like, this Tennessee offense is legit. And the front seven, I've been saying for weeks, I think the front seven is as good as anywhere in the SEC on the defensive side of the ball in Tennessee. Yeah. And that is scary as all get up. Yeah, but you listen, but when you don't have Joe Milton, you don't have anybody that can throw it 70 yards. <laughs> from a knee. Yeah, yeah. From knee. yeah. 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 From his, on his knees. Yeah. yeah. So that. So I mean, and what do you have if you don't have a quarterback who can throw it seventy yards from their knees? Wins. I mean. But other than that, nothing. <laughs> um, Joy, your biggest takeaway from Saturday. What were you watching? What were you looking at? What was I not watching? Would probably be the easier thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did have direct TV, so I had to like last minute maneuver that Ease whole time. Peace and peace. Uh-huh. On that, yeah. But I, it didn't affect me last week because I was at a game in person. And so I, it didn't even register until Saturday morning when I woke up and realized I couldn't watch it with that. Um, yeah, I was watching a bunch of different games. Um, obviously, that early morning slate had a lot of wild things happening. You're sitting here thinking these are all going to be blowouts. It's like non-ranked opponents. It's schools that paid $1.4 million to play their opponents. And um, so I was super intrigued with all those games. Penn State. Bowling Green really caught me from the get-go. Um, I mean, you're sitting here talking about Bowling Green takes the opening drive 75 yards on six plays to lead that game 7-0 from the start. Absolutely abysmal performance by Penn State's defense. And I am so sick of hearing every year about how good they're going to be. I, I'm over it. I am so sick of people buying into it. James Franklin's not the guy. He's just not the guy. He cannot do it. And every year we're sold this packet of lies. He gaslights better than Les Miles. I mean, every year he tells everyone how good they're going to be. And every year they embarrass themselves. And if it's not on the offensive side of the ball, it's on the defensive side of the ball. They they cannot make the two mesh together well. I thought Drew Aller played okay. They ended up winning that game, but not by a lot. And I frankly was just... I'm not impressed with them, and I think the worst thing that's going to happen to them is that they were kind of always able to hang around in their conference because there were only two big guys at the top of their conference. Well, that's not the case anymore. Right. So now you're you're you've now fallen to the middle, maybe the bottom of the pack. Um, Notre Dame was the most beautiful thing that I have ever seen because for Notre Dame, for me, it's never a question of if they're going to fall apart; it's when they're going to fall apart. And it has nothing to do with their coaching situation. I know Notre Dame fans are going to really come at me. They already have. I made a tweet about Brian Kelly could win big games and Marcus Freeman can't win the small ones. It just is what it is. Um, But they, they, they are every year, again, just like Penn State, every year hyped up and every year we're left out. The difference in Notre Dame is they don't play anyone throughout the year. Um, and so they sometimes make it to the playoff, and that's when we find out what kind of team they are. This year, thank the Lord for Northern Illinois, decided to show up and show us really early the kind of team that they are. Um, I also think everyone really, really bought in and said, oh, they beat a good A&M team at A&M week one. Like, they're actually going to be something. Who said A&M was a good team? Like, no one said that. And then everyone just bought it. I'm like, they have a brand new coach. They lost a ton to the transfer portal. Half their players have been bought, and we know that works out, i.e. Colorado. I'm sitting here going, why are we giving them all kinds of credit when they actually haven't done anything of substance? And then we're sitting here completely and totally shocked. Now, should they have beat Northern Illinois? Absolutely. Just talent-wise, you have more talent on that side of the ball. But Riley Leonard did not like the Riley center that we saw from Duke. He massively struggled. And that's not, if, if this was them playing a quality opponent, I would say, okay, maybe the lack of competitive play in the ACC is not is not translating over. But you're playing Northern Illinois. I mean, half those guys are walk-ons. They are laughing on their way to the bank right now with a $1.4 million check. 
I don't know where Notre Dame goes from here. I do think it's going to take them, like, they're going to have to have a hard look in the mirror and say, is Marcus Freeman the guy? Which will, Notre Dame will really, really struggle with doing that because historically speaking, they don't get rid of coaches. Coaches retire. Um, they, they are not the kind of school that just gets rid of a coach whenever he's not doing well. Um, last year, you made a completely moronic mistake and did not have the players you had on the field against an Ohio State team. But, and you should have won that game. And it's almost like since that game, there's been this looming over of we're just not capable of doing what we should be able to do. And quite frankly, their expectations are asinine and ignorant. They're just never as good as they think they are, and they don't belong where they think they belong. But they do need to have a hard look in the mirror about what they're producing and what they're putting on the field if they do think that they're a college football playoff contender moving forward. Because what we saw last night, if there was an NIT of college football, I wouldn't even put them in that. I mean, that was how bad that performance was. Listen, a couple things that I that I feel pretty good about. Um, one, Joy, you found a way to get Texas A and M in there. You found a way to throw Texas A and M under the bus in there. Like that is the kind of pro move that I feel like. Again, it's chess, not checkers. You rank in South Carolina ahead of the LSU game. You find a way to make Notre Dame being bad a way to criticize Texas A and M, and I love it. You didn't get you didn't get a reference to Jimbo, but other than that, like it was fine. Um, they, maybe Notre Dame should hire him. That's fun. <laughs> that would, boy, the the social accounts would go crazy for Joy if that were to happen. Listen, we're talking about a coach that's got losses, John, to Marshall and Northern Illinois now on his resume. Like back to back seasons. I mean, he's the Notre Dame football coach, and he's got losses to Marshall and Northern Illinois on his resume. And don't mistake this as a, like a Marshall team that was just like, you know, like plucky and figured out a way to mm-hmm. they just ran it right at this Notre Dame defense that I was told was one of the best in college football yeah they got a five foot five running back that weighs about 390 pounds and he just ran it through the middle of that Notre Dame defensive front um <clears throat> I just find it hilarious to Joy's point that like after last week beating Texas a and on the road which let's say you know like it's fine but you beat Texas A&M and you look at the schedule and everyone is just penciling in. No, I'm talking about like legitimate mm-hmm. ball knowers are in are out here saying like, well, Notre Dame's minus 500 to make the college football playoff. But it's probably still a good bet because it's so safe. So you just mm-hmm. tie up a bunch of money in Notre Dame to make the – well – um, Notre Dame could win 10 in a row right now, and they still wouldn't make they still don't deserve to be in the college football playoff. You lose to Northern Illinois at home in week two. I do not care if you beat Southern Cal. I do not care what you do for the rest of your schedule. You don't deserve to be in the playoff. And and spoiler alert, they're not going 10 and in their next 10. Like this Notre Dame team is deeply flawed, John. Did you, did you see? Did you you go back to your defensive line comment? Did you see that defensive line versus North again, Northern Illinois. I mean, 190 yards rushing to Northern Illinois. Um, and that's and what's wild about this is that's the second I, I understand, like Marcus Freeman is a defensive coach, right? Like, I understand if, like, okay, you know, new new head coach, relatively, I mean, he's not new anymore, but relatively new. He he was the defensive coordinator there, but I understand if it's like, okay, transfer quarterbacks, I'm still trying to figure out the offense, whatever. But you can't, with the defensive mind that Marcus Freeman was supposed to be and the rosters that he's supposed to put together at Notre Dame, you can't give up 190 yards rushing to Northern Illinois where they just literally run it down your throat. And um, and I think the issue the issue is, like, you, you've all said it, it's, it's – you don't come back from that. Like, that's not – like, that's not a thing that, like, okay, well – we had this situation and, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, Joy, you, you were mentioning like, like I will say, I'll use the example of Georgia in 2019 when they lost to South Carolina at home and they had, you know, like a gazillion turnovers and all those things. Like that's different. That South Carolina team was very, very bad, but it was an SEC team. It was a power five. It was a commerce team. It was, you know, all those things. This is not, this is not anywhere in the stratosphere of that. And I think people like, no. I think so it's 28 it's, and a half point spread. Yeah. Like 28 and a half point. And, and not only that, but it's also like to, again, to Joy's point, it's like the talent disparity between these two teams. It's like, 
it supposedly was such was a wide wide um gap and boy it didn't look like it it didn't look like it up front and that's the thing for me is like to your point daniel like i don't i mean there's no way they're running the table because they're just get they just got bullied um by, by by the freaking huskies of northern illinois um so congratulations notre dame um fantastic and and what i and what and what i love about it is that it's the same refrain every year. Why is Notre Dame ranked so high? They go out and they win a decent game, and everybody piles on. And then, and then as soon as everybody piles on, it happens. So this is also where then their refusal to join a conference comes back to kick them in the butt because mm-hmm. they don't ever have anything of substance on their schedule. And so it's not even like they can make the argument of like we've improved. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we had a, you know, like, and Alabama, the, I'm only using this because it's a recent memory, but obviously Alabama lost to Texas last year, mm-hmm. a very different team than Northern Illinois. But then you watched Alabama week after week play the best of the best and get better week after week. Mm-hmm. The problem with Notre Dame is they're not shut up to be able to do that because their schedule is easier than, you know, Jimbo walking into a bank right now. And so it's, it, they, they have set themselves up for failure at every level. No, I mean, they have guys, I mean, they have Purdue, Miami of Ohio, Louisville, which is a decent team, Stanford, Georgia tech, Navy, Florida state, Virginia, and army and the USC. Like, Let I mean, me ask I you this, John, which <laughs> of those teams is worse than Northern Illinois? Which of those teams uh, do you have power ranked below Northern <laughs> Illinois? Which one of those is, is not no. a losable game? For well, they're all they're all losable games. That's for what I'm saying. I'm, I might, but to your to your question though, I might have Stanford and maybe well, maybe Stanford Miami. Ohio, TCU. Maybe. Well, that's like, true. I, that's true. That's true. Stanford but no, you're no, you're right. You're right though. I mean, it's, yeah, you look down that you list are. and every one every one of those every one of those teams you would put ahead of Northern Illinois if you yeah. hadn't saw you what just, happened. On you Saturday. just lost at home to the worst team on your schedule. Period. Yeah. Like Correct. one, there are twelve teams on your schedule. You just lost at home to the worst one of them. Yep. Um, it's bad, and it leads me kind of right into my biggest takeaway for college football, which is just that college football is awesome. Yes, like college football, just <laughs> it's better than whatever sport you're into. Like whatever you like to do on Saturday, the thrift store mm. or like the antique mall, like whatever. It's college football is better than that. It's just better. um, there's. There was so much chaos on Saturday. We're talking about five ranked teams, guys, lost outright on the field. Three of them lost to unranked teams. But that doesn't even count the five more ranked teams that all barely survived. Jordan already mentioned Penn State. I mean, we talk about a team like Oklahoma State, a team that did not deserve in any way, shape, or form to beat Arkansas. And yet somehow, some way, Sam Pittman – loves getting fired he wants to get fired so bad and so that's well like, that's the that's the best job in college football the, a fired a fired head coach and i know sam is he ready to, he's ready to be at the, life. he's ready to be at the lake with his uh hog statue the fountain yeah. thing that he got installed yeah he's ready he's ready I'm to be there Jimbo. they're already making hot appointments i mean that man's everybody. trying to drink that man's just trying to get out there drinking old cold beer like at the lake like, don't get in his way <laughs> Don't get his way. I mean, Kansas State, another Big 12 team, barely beat, like barely survives against Tulane. That's a decent Tulane team. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Iowa goes down to Iowa State at home. Like, there's a, a um, Il- Kansas loses to to Illinois. Oklahoma barely survives against mm-hmm. Houston. So you're gonna, you're gonna talk about five ranked teams barely survive. Five ranked teams lose. Three of them to unranked teams. I'm not great at math, guys. That's 10 of the top 25 either lost or almost lost on Saturday. That's 40% of the ranked teams in America were either in a nail-biter or lost the game on the field. Mm. Um, it was a, it was an absolutely exceptional Saturday of college football. And I just pose this to, to both of you as a, as a question, maybe. Like you mentioned Penn State earlier, um, Joy, in talking about a team that's just like they're done, we're writing them off. Penn State's two and zero, a two and zero football team. Like how how big of a deal? If you're a fan of one of these teams, let's say you're a fan of OU this morning, or you're a fan of Penn State, your team won the game. They beat the team that they were supposed to beat. Now they didn't cover any spreads, or they didn't make you any money, but they won the game. They're two and zero. You're a Kansas State fan. Like 
how bad of a thing is how big of a deal is it if your team messes around plays with its food and barely squeaks by one of these things are you freaking out as a fan at this point or are you just like are we two and oh everything is like we're gonna fix it like everybody has an off week like where do we stand on this like what what how should fans be feeling I think there's just I I, I kind of think every situation is different um and I feel like that there were like there were some games that you just didn't even mention like the fact that South Florida took Alabama to the fourth quarter like that game was yes. insane the fact that Nichols played LSU so tight that we were going into we were midway through the third quarter before LSU fans were feeling comfortable so I can speak like for me um yeah we well we're one and one we're not even two and oh but um that game did not leave me feeling well I'm nervous about going to play South Carolina our defense still has major holes in it our offensive play calling still has some question marks and we're getting riddled with injuries right now so I think that there's teams like LSU for instance that can that it, those games like that just tend to expose things that you can be worried about. Then there's other teams, and I'll just use Alabama as an example. They have historically sometimes struggled to get up for games where they are so superior from their opponent. And if you really look at that fourth quarter, I mean, it was like all of a sudden everyone was like, oh, yeah, I'm here to, to do what I came here for. And then they just run rampant. And, and their talent is so much greater than their opponents and, and great enough to be, you know, one of the most talented programs in the country. They're less nervous. Um, Penn State, if I'm Penn State, I'm nervous. Um, I, and I think I'm just nervous, maybe not even from that specific game, but I'm nervous at the fact that history is yet again repeating itself. We're yet again struggling with teams we shouldn't yeah. struggle with. We're yet again having the same issues on both sides of the ball. And we're yet again going to go into a gauntlet and probably not going to be able to beat these big teams that we never can get past anyway. So I think it's obviously on a school by school basis, but I think a lot of schools that we saw yesterday struggle should be nervous. Oklahoma, I mean, the SEC is about to hang you out to dry. You're about to get absolutely. Te Texas is about to hang you out to dry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you got like, Texas I coming up in a couple of weeks. Oklahoma, I mean, there's a very good chance they might not even be bowl eligible. I mean, there, there's just some teams that I, if you're looking at the end of this, you're going, um, this this could get real ugly real fast. And the flip side of that is that now the playoffs bigger, and some schools are saying like we might actually have a legitimate shot at this thing. Um, so that there, it's a double sided coin. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's so many of these games like we didn't talk about like Arizona going into the fourth quarter was ahead by what two points three points mm -hmm. against against northern arizona like they were down at halftime in that game arizona the school that like, came out broke all these records in week one fan base is feeling good about themselves like so many i mean oregon we haven't talked about oregon yet like are you kidding me like you want to talk about a team that survived on saturday the oregon ducks at home um last second field goal to win that game it's a yeah, I do think it's a case by case basis, but um, it. I've said before, I really think you learned something about your team, like, and and that's going to come back around. Like, what whatever you saw there, you're going to see it again. It, it's very rare the case of a like you mentioned Alabama last year. When's the next time Alabama's going to schedule South Florida guys? By the way, like, do you think probably pretty soon, right? Like, they're probably pretty anxious to play them again. It's been a really fun two years for Alabama fans. <laughs> Like, yeah, they're as anxious to play them again as Dion's ready to play North Dakota State again. Yeah, yeah. I have a so just Dion stop schedule up on our Tuesday show. Like, we're, oh yeah, we're, 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 yeah, we're, plenty of Dion conversation. Plenty of time for Dion conversation. Um, uh, all right, that's enough for today. Um, thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the show uh, on YouTube. Follow all the socials. She is Joy. And he is John and I am Daniel and we'll see you guys next time on the Speak Easy Sports Show.